really happy that we can be here as a group. Um, thank you very much, Tara and Gopi, inviting us. Um, it's really nice that we have the opportunity to get in discussion with you. Um, I also would like to acknowledge my um, nuclear medicine radiologist, because without him, we couldn't do this work together. I think it's a symbiosis, and this is actually the message that come through, should come through to this talk, because you have to go and talk to the you know, orthopedic surgeon when you want to do musculoskeletal nuclear medicine. And you have to sit, and it, it took us like, I think, one and a half years to find the same language to talk about musculoskeletal stuff. But now we are nearly there. <laughs> So my talk is about um, use of SPECT CT in a painful post-operative knee. So um, that's that's actually a big, big, big topic. Um, we didn't submit an abstract. That's why we um, uh, gave some flyers to you um, to give an overview about the stuff we do. So this is the protocol we use um, for the knee joint. We use three millimeter slices of the femoral head. We use 0.7 millimeter slices in the knee joint, high resolution, and then also 3 millimeter slices for the ankle shot. And then you would say, well, why do you use it for the knee joint when you have a knee problem? Why do you want to get this information? And I try to get, give you this information by, by this talk. This is an example of how it looks like when you have several arthroplasty stuff. We call it 4D SPECT-CT. Why, why do we call it 4D SPECT-CT? Because actually, well, as an orthopedic surgeon, this is, this is actually the fraternity I come from. Um, <laughs> we are interested in this. So we are trained in mechanics, biomechanics. There is not much bio, but there is a lot of mechanics. <laughs> and so there is a lot of structure. And then there is this biological thing. Most of the orthopedic surgeons are not really interested in I have to, I have to say. <laughs> so we left this field a long time ago for the rheumatologists. But I think more and more people start thinking, not every orthopedic surgeon is really simple-minded. Most, most of them just pretend. So I think this is really interesting. This is the interesting bit, and I want to tell you. This is mechanics, structure, and biology. And then only if you put this together, this is the information you want to have. If you only look at these images and see, oh, the CT is like this, and then you have a bone scan, you have a hot dot there, and no dot there, that's not it. This is it. This is what we want to talk about. Okay, so 3D CT is used to have an accurate anatomical localization in 3D. That's, that's important. We can define the structure, and this is really not novel. And then, for arthroplasty patients, what we need to get is we need to get the component position right. I know it's a lot of stuff I, I just throw at your direction, and some of you wouldn't have heard about any component stuff and any component position stuff. But this is what orthopedic surgeons are interested in. It's about mechanics, it's about component position in these patients. That's what we do. We do measure these components. Are they implanted the right way how to do it? You have several degrees of freedom and you have clear guidelines how you have to implant. This is an example of a total knee arthroplasty you can see here. You know how to implant it, but you have to judge, is this implanted right? If it's not, it may have implication on your bone scan, on, on your spec part. And this is actually published how to analyze these 3D data sets and how to determine the component position. And then this is another stuff we do. We set, like differentiate the knee joint in several anatomical areas this is an example of a total knee. You see the total knee arthroplasty here in place. This is the plastic and this is the metal bit. And this is quite interesting because we have defined several areas which relate to the component. And we believe that it's not the uptake only. It's not the intensity what we are looking for. It's the uptake pattern. And this uptake pattern is dependent on the implantation. So how do we like get the component position right. It's dependent on mechanics and biology. And you have to get this everything in just um, otherwise you will fail with your diagnosis. For this, we also developed a new method how to quantify, normalize, localize the data. Um, I don't want to go in detail here, but this is actually 
uh, upcoming in the BMC medical imaging stuff. So what we do with the ratios, and so we can compare these intensity values as well. But we more believe that the intensity value is not that important. It might be the areas where there is no tracer uptake, which are more interesting in some fields. So what is the problem with knee alphoplasty? So this is a patient you want to see in our clinic having a total knee joint and running around at the beach. That's perfect. But actually, if you look at the literature, in the orthopedic literature, you find about 20% are not happy. If you go to the rheumatologist, it's more on the 40% side. So um, to be honest, that's quite bad. And there are a lot of problems we have to consider for arthroplasty patients. I'd like to show you some cases for arthroplasty. This is a patient, typical patient, has the 86 years, 14 years post total, uh, total knee on the left side, three years on the other on the right side, and left knee pain. And this is, this is like the plain scintigraph you, you're used to. And then we get this. We have also developed a special software to, to get the components and to get an idea of how the trace uptake really relates to the components here. What you see here, this is, this is actually a revision total knee, and this is like a primary total knee. This is a full uh, joint replacement for the knee joint. You you see the femoral bit and you see the tibia bit. What you don't see is the plastic between. So what is this? We look at this and now we have analyzed about 150 of these painful total knees. And what we did, we measured the component position, we did measure the mechanical axis, anatomical axis, and we measured like where is this tracer uptake and we quantified this tracer. What we could show is that if you find tracer uptake in these areas, on the component. This is highly indicative of a femoral loosening problem. So this patient has been revised, the femoral component was loose. And this is the other information we take. We take the mechanical stuff. We take the information about rotational alignment, sagittal, and coronal alignment. This is another case. You see the details here. I like a new knee, like a partial half knee replacement, then it was revised to a total knee replacement. You see some orthopods were working here and they thought, uh, better leave the foot within the bone. Um, no, just kidding, they like, probably just broke the bones, uh, the, 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 the drill, so they left the drill in. Um, you shouldn't see this on, on images, but um, <laughs> you see it happens. And was activity related knee pain? If you look at, at radiographs, you would say, okay, doesn't look too bad. The patient is in pain. And you see the plane is here. <clears throat> and this is how it looks like when you look at SPAT CT. And this is actually quite interesting bit. You see there is hardly any uptake at the femoral side, but you see a lot of uptake all around the tibial base plate. And this is highly indicative for the loosening of the tibial side. And another interesting finding is Normally, you try to have a posterior slope. That means that the component is sloped this way on the tibial side to posterior. But this component was sloped anterior. So this is definitely a malposition, which could explain the loosening. Last case for total stuff. Another case, you see the history up there, 62 years, right into a knee pain. And this is how it looks like. Pristine, no uptake at all at the femoral side, no uptake at all at the tibial side, the patient is in pain. <coughs> this is the cause of the problem you see, there is lighting up within the patellofemoral joint. So, what was the cause of the problem? In most of the cases, at least in Switzerland, we don't replace the patella in the primary surgery. So what you do, you replace the femoral bed, you replace the tibial bed, but you leave the patella because there is a big discussion in the orthopedic world, is it necessary to or not? And then we see a lot of patients coming back with patellofemoral overloading or problems here. And then this is what, what the patients get, they get a secondary resurfacing of the patella when the patient was happy afterwards. <coughs> now we have the partial knee replacement. I started with the totals because we have most or the biggest evidence about the clinical value for the total so far, but we're also developing evidence for the partial replacements. 
So this is female, 54 years, had a partial knee replacement, that means only the medial side was substituted. And then this is how the spectacle looks like. And if you come closer here, you see, you see like there are some radiolucent lines under the tibial component. <coughs> now this is, this is a bit weird here, you see a hyper, hyperdense area here. And then you start thinking, what could this be? This was actually an osteonecrosis. This was caused because we used bone cement to, get, to fix this tibial implant. And then the bone cement caused an osteonecrosis during surgery in this area. And we put the patient on biphosphonates. Um, the outcome is not really there so far. So in that case, also, you need to see a partial knee replacement. That's another type of implant, and that's also important. You have to consider what type of implant you use, because partial knee replacement is not partial knee replacement. There are 100 companies out there selling partial knee replacements. They all have different biomechanical strategies how to align these components. Now, this actually is very important that you consider what is the key behind this. So you have to talk to your orthopedic surgeon. So what you see here is, you see uptake here. Why is this uptake here? This uptake is there because you have an impingement of the component within the tibial side on the femoral side. And so what did you have to do? You had to do an arthroscopic department of the medial notch. You don't have to revise the component then. You get a lot more information from these images than you think. Take home message for the arthroplasty bit is, we are actually doing a lot better than years before with the SPECT CT imaging. And <coughs> the key is the combined analysis of component position, tracer uptake, and also mechanical stuff. You have to get some knowledge about that, sorry to say that. Or you have to find someone who has knowledge in, in this field. Future research we do is like, what is the osteointegration process? We run studies on what is the natural history. So do uh, pre-op, one year, two year, post-op studies to say which is normal, what is a normal lead, what is a... And we might work on you know, the tracers and imaging analysis tools, are, I think, are coming up to, to have like, to, to, to offer some help analyzing it. Then we have the field of patients with osteoarthritis. And actually, this is quite an interesting study we did. What we did is we looked at alignment. That means, like, do you have a bowed leg or an X-shaped leg, or do you have any patellofemoral abnormality? Does this give the patient a different tracer uptake pattern? And actually, it did. You see, this is a varus aligned knee, so that's a bowed leg, and you see medial uptake, only hardly, hardly any uptake in any other area. If you look for an X-shaped leg, you see it on the lateral side. And if you have a patellofemoral problem, you see some area in by lighting up in the patellofemoral stuff. So this is actually the basic investigation we did, and then we said, okay, this is interesting because there is a lot of there are a lot of procedures out there where we change alignment in orthopedic surgery. We make a bowed leg like a footballer like this, we we'll make him like this, so he can be a goalie. <laughs> So I think it's very helpful not only to get information, is this hot spot still there? So you have a pre-op scanning, and then you see the medial uptake, increased medial uptake. And then one year you come back after surgery and say, okay, this should be gone now. This uptake should be gone. If it's not gone, you have undercorrected your knee joint. If it's on the lateral side, you have overcorrected. So it's more uptake on the lateral side. If there is none uptake, that's a happy knee joint. So that's what we want. But there are also problems. You see, this is a plate. And there is the gap. You just, you actually, you saw the bone, you break the bone, and then you distract <coughs> the bone. And so some fill, put some fillers in, some biodegradable stuff. And you can also see, is this really working with the fillers? So these are the questions we have for the HDLs, and I think we're pretty good getting an answer for this. And this is another field of interest. This is ACL surgery. Coming back to the case I showed you at the beginning, 
this is what we do. We have these, these voxel, 3D voxel-based analysis. What we do is like we do uh, intensity classification in all the areas. And we could, we, we're going to analyze the tunnels, we analyze the tunnel position, and then we get values which you compare in studies to others. This is, this is the case I showed you at the beginning. This is increased uptake within the femoral bone tunnel. You see some patellofemoral overloading, and this are actually getting published. This case, we got like five more from all over the world. They said, oh, I have the same problem, but no one told me that, that we can solve the problem. So for ACL surgery, it's the same. It's biomechanics, so we want to know where the tunnels for ACL reconstructions are. And we want to know where the biology stuff is. This is also an interesting question. You tension your ACL graft, but no one knows how much tension we need. This might be a tool to say something about this tensioning process. So I think we have a lot of questions uh, in orthopedic surgery which could, could be answered by using SPECT CT. Currently, we also use SPECT CT to determine if we want to go for these patients for a pure cartilage repairs surgery or if we need something more like an osteochondral procedure. If, if the MRI looks like this, you, could, you can't say on MRI, this is the same image. You could say, oh, this is a cartilage problem, we do cartilage surgery on this guy. No, if you look at this, this is definitely an osteochondral problem. Their bone is, there is a problem with the bone underlying the cartilage. So I think this is an important thing to differentiate patients to get the indication right before surgery. This is another case, you know, is this bone still active or do we have to revise this patient? This, this was just a dead bone and we had to revise it, we divided it and redid it. But if you look at MRI, you don't know. This is actually the thing we do. Sometimes we go into the spec CT and MRI and then get a better idea about the soft tissues. This is another case after an osteochondral procedure. What you see here is like there is an osteochondral graft. The thing what you see here is you see that there is stone growing in from the side. So this is this is the uh, sign of healing. So this is what you want to see after an osteochondral procedure. So it helps you pre and post operatively. Okay, this is this is just future. And so I told you at the beginning we have more evidence for the first arthroplasty things I told you, but but cartilage surgery I could be really future. And these are some references if you want to look it up, it's, it's also in the flyer. Thank you very much for your attention.